Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fitch's latest edition of its virtual investor series. And this year, we're going to focus on post-COVID trends and challenges still facing the securization market. My name is Rui Pereira, and I'm the Global Head of Structured Finance and Covered Bonds at Fitch. And I'm joined today by credit leaders across our structured finance businesses. So I'm pleased to welcome Ben McCarthy, who leads our Asia Pacific portfolio, uh, Susanna Matern, who leads our European structured finance business, and Mike Palladino, who's responsible for our North American structured finance portfolio. We've been hosting these virtual meetings well before the, the pandemic, and we believe they offer a great opportunity for us to share our views with global investors. So let's get started. Ben, what have been the biggest credit surprises in the APAC region, and what risks are you concerned about heading into the second half of the year? Thanks, Rui, and thanks everyone for joining us. Asia-Pacific collateral performance through COVID crisis has been nothing short of remarkable. Right across the region, there was a bit of a performance blip early in 2020, but since then, all parts of the region are largely back to pre-COVID level performance. So undoubtedly, the biggest credit surprise has been the strength of the consumer right across the region. With the assistance of government and lender support packages, which I think we underestimated at the start of the crisis, the consumer has been remarkably resilient. Um, even at the beginning of the year, we had some concern about uh, collateral performance that would deteriorate as these support packages um, sort of faded or, or, or ended. Um, and really, we, we haven't seen any real degree of, of underperformance uh, this year at all. In terms of the outlook, the economies across the region, are, you know, if anything, they're, they're continuing to improve. There's still some downside risk, particularly in markets where COVID's not under control, which you know, in this region is really India and to a lesser extent Japan. But even in those markets, performance uh, still looks very, very good. In terms of risks, uh, COVID remains a risk. Um, aside from that, the potential asset bubbles are significant. We've seen house prices, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, rise particularly fast, fueled by, by low interest rates. And with the growth outlay remains good, uh, interest rates remain low, we, we see, expect this to, to run a little bit further. So to the extent that it's fueled by debt, that could cause us problems in the future. So that you know, that's something we're watching. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Suzanne, how do things look in Europe and, and what's your asset performance outlook for European structured finance and, and how does it differ by, by country and sector? My answer is quite similar to Ben's in some respects because similarly to Australia, asset performance has generally held up better than initially feared and the economic as well as the labour market forecast is now much more benign. Clearly, uh, the developments this year and next year will be largely dependent by how successful the vaccine rollout will be and how quickly governments will lift the restrictions. But um, recently, the economic forecasts both for the EU and for the UK have been improved. For the EU, for this year and next year, they are around 4.5%. For the UK, around 5%. So quite um, strong growth rates. Now, what does all that mean for performance? So generally good things. So in terms of RMBS and ABS, we expect a stable performance because um, the um, end of the support schemes coincides with um, the strengthening of a recovery. What are the areas to watch? Um, in RMBS, I would mention non-conforming UK because payment holidays are still higher than the UK average and also arrears have gone up over the last 12 months to 8% from 6%. Nevertheless, we don't think that this slight deterioration in asset performance will affect ratings. Similar on the ABS side, where at the moment performance metrics like arrears levels in auto ABS or charge-offs in credit cards are stable or even improving, but they might slightly deteriorate once the support schemes um, run out. Now, uh, in terms of CLOs, uh, we have seen that um, certain important credit metrics like the weighted average rating factor and the triple C bucket have improved, but they are still at elevated levels compared to pre-pandemic levels. Nevertheless, this improvement, as well as also our better forecasts for leverage low default rates in Europe, which is now 3.5% for this year and 4% for next year, mean that we are able to stabilize negative outlooks so turn negative outlooks of sub-investment grade CLO nodes to stable outlooks. And last but not least in terms of CMBS, and I will only mention the subsectors that we rate in Europe. So retail is clearly under pressure, has been under pressure pre-pandemic, in the pandemic is now still under pressure, and we still have a negative outlook on the ratings. However, 
We believe the um, market adjustments are included in the rents. Um, office will clearly um, see um, differentiation uh, based on property quality as well as um, location, but there's no uh, way out of um, the fact that demand will clearly be lower for office space. And then the two segments that uh, where the risk perception is better is the industrial segment in CMBS and also the res residential CMBS segment, which is uh, multifamily housing. Great, thank you, Susanna. So Mike, over to you, same question. So how has the North American portfolio performed and, and what's your outlook for the remainder of the year? And if you can briefly touch on some of the subsectors that remain under pressure and, and your rating outlook for those. Yeah, sure. So you're going to hear some similar themes. Collateral performance was you know, much better than expected in, in, in North America as well. Um, you know, you saw corporate loans within CLOs fared much better than uh, we would have expected, despite, you know, exposure to some heavily impacted travel and leisure sectors. You know, we were originally uh, looking for a two-year loan default rate of around 15% in 2020 to 2021, um, which would have been above the 13.5% rate we saw in 2008 and 9. But that forecast now come down to around 7%. Consumer ABS and RBS collateral also performed uh, you know, better than expected, benefiting heavily from government support uh, programs. You know, the post-pandemic economic growth outlook should um, continue to provide some tailwinds to asset performance going forward while those support programs uh, subside. Uh, most of our pandemic-related actions uh, came in the form of um, you know, negative outlooks and watches rather than downgrades, but much of that signaling is now being addressed, um, you know, except for certain pockets of CMBS and, and consumer ABS. Within RMBS, we've seen uh, you know, notable improvement in that portfolio with negative outlooks and watches declining to around 9% from around 18% last summer. Um, and we recently removed our, our COVID stresses there. Uh, we're also in the process of reconsidering our, our stresses in, in other sectors as well. So in fact, um, you know, if you exclude sort of CMBS conduit transactions where we've seen some pressure in ABS uh, student loan and FELP transactions that are tied to the negative outlook on the US government, um, our negative outlook percentage would actually be similar to pre-crisis levels at around six to seven uh, percent. So the portfolio right now is in pretty good shape at the moment, but there are a couple of pockets of weakness to note in the near term where we, we do have a, a more concerning view. Uh, so first would be CNBS transactions with outside exposure to retail and hotels. Uh, that remains under pressure in the near term, um, while those with uh, you know, an uncertain office outlook may come under uh, more pressure in, in the medium term. And then second, within, within ABS, uh, the weakness that we saw in rental cars was largely the result of an idiosyncratic bankruptcy that's close to being resolved. So that's, um, you know, that's heading into the rearview mirror, but um, aircraft transactions still remain under pressure due to uh, structural weakness. So we're still uh, closely following that. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. So let, let's pivot a little bit and to just talk a little bit about market uh, conditions and, and new trends. So Susanna, I think as, um, you know, certainly as um, economies start to improve and, and, and markets continue to recover, uh, what are some of the new trends you're seeing in the European structured finance market? I would mention maybe three trends. Um, some of them are not that new, but we see that they are accelerating. So the first is um, a trend away from the classical bank lender to new types of lenders, particularly fintechs, where we have seen proposals, also rated proposals over the past years, but at the moment we see an accelerated acceleration of um, proposals on our desks. And we think this may have also to do with a pandemic because uh, borrowers are more open to online lending potentially than they have been before. Now, um, these new types of lending also come uh, with certain considerations. Um, on the rating side, uh, the three considerations are unchanged from how we approached um, other new lenders in the past. Um, so the first point is uh, the representativeness of historical performance data from these lenders, because often we see uh, dramatically increasing origination volumes, as well as the changing underwriting criteria. The second point is the alignment of interest and the extent of regulatory oversight over these lenders. And the third point is the service replaceability. Now, in RMBS, we have for years seen uh, the prevalence of new lenders, but not just new lenders. Now we also see in the European market a dominance of non-bank lenders. And this has clearly to do with the availability of cheap central bank funding 
which uh, attracts bank lenders away from RMBS and then leads to higher non-bank issuance within RMBS. But uh, we specialized non-bank lenders often prefer quite complex liability structures because they, if you like, want to optimize the capital structure, which then comes with more complex analytical considerations and more often leads to split ratings. Now, the second trend I wanted to mention is the trend towards electric um, vehicles, not new, but accelerating. In Q1 21 compared to Q1 2020, in the EU plus the UK, we saw an increase in sales volumes for pure electric vehicles of 62%, hybrid vehicles of 162%, which is a dramatic increase towards this new engine type. But there's also another trend, namely that the engine, which used to be the heart of a car, um, is not that important anymore because cars are now driving computers, which also means they need an ecosystem around them and um, are much more dependent on software. And uh, this comes again with additional analytical considerations we need to make and um, can also lead to potentially higher dependencies on manufacturers. But um, we believe um, these additional risks or other risks compared to traditional combustion vehicles can be addressed by our existing criteria. And the third trend is, is a newer trend, ESG, where uh, securitization clearly lags behind um, other, uh, as other segments of the fixed income markets, but there's a lot of attention specifically in Europe from policymakers as well as from investors to um, see um, significant developments um, in the ESG area. And for structured finance, I would say that potentially uh, the sector where we see most ESG considerations already incorporated is the CLO segment. They have started to very early on uh, work with exclusion criteria with regards to certain industries. And more recently also added CLOs that are marketed as a fully ESG compliant transaction based on asset manager scorings. But these are only a few, and the exclusion criteria are generally in place for, I think, virtually all European CLOs. Thank you, Susanna. Um, Mike, can, can you weigh in? So what can investors expect from the North American structured finance market in the second half of the year? And, and, and what new developments or trends are, are, are you tracking in the region? Yeah, sure. I mean, following on Susanna's last point, you know, seeing a lot of interest in, in ESG measurement uh, as well, although it seems that the market in, the, in North America doesn't have, uh, you know, significant consistency in terms of what it wants and or needs, you know, from these benchmarks. That's something that I think will continue to evolve heavily uh, in the near to medium term. Uh, next, you know, it's been around for a while, um, you know, but uh, yeah, and, and on the radar, developments related to LIBOR are, are still notable for floating rate structures such as CLOs, uh, student loan transactions, and RMBS. And, you know, the pushback of the cessation of the main LIBOR benchmarks until June 23 increases the likelihood of a legislative fix. So at this point, we wouldn't expect to sign any um, LIBOR-related negative outlooks until around you know sort of mid 22. Um, we're also seeing, you know, an, an investor search for yield driving demand for new products and structures such as, you know, the growth in, in RMBS investor loans, for example. Uh, within CMBS, we continue to see strong SASB issuance volume in the market. However, we're primarily only rating those that consist of uh, trophy type assets. And then lastly, um, we're also seeing strong demand for transactions involving esoteric assets, um, you know, which is covered within our cross asset group. Uh, amid this search for yield, we've been rating transactions that include things like container ABS and solar ABS. However, you know, as the market continues to push the envelope on these types of non-traditional securitizations, uh, we maintain discipline on other asset classes like whole business and um, data center securitizations. So we feel you know, at this point in the cycle where uh, yield is in such demand, it's important to maintain credit standards in our approach. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. And, and Ben, um, I, I guess the question for you is, what's the outlook for Chinese, uh, Chinese structured uh, finance? And, and what are, are, are we continuing to see growth in, in, in products for international investors? Uh, what's the outlook? What's the outlook there? Thanks, Rui. Um, the, as always with Asia, if you talk Asia, you're talking about China and the China market is, continues to grow. And, and there's loads of opportunities for international investors um, to get involved in China. Uh, the big sectors 
where we're involved are, are autos and RMBS. And to give you some numbers for the first quarter, uh, China had 17 RMBS transactions from 12 issuers with issuance volume was just over 20 billion US dollars um, and 10 auto transactions from nine issuers with the issuance was just roughly 9 billion US dollars. Um, but this is just a fraction of what's happening in China. As I said earlier, the, um, you know, the performance has been excellent. Um, in terms of international ratings and the things that, um, you know, that we're involved in, the vast majority of auto ABS um, attract international investors and international ratings. Um, and the larger issues in, in RMBS, so the, 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 the large uh, state-owned banks are now tapping international investors as well. Um, and so as we sort of look forward, the next sector looks to be uh, the consumer finance sector, um, where we're, we're likely to see international investors start to come into that market as well. Great. Thank you, Ben. So uh, let's let's wrap it up. And I'm going to pose a sort of one last question to each of you. And, and that is, you know, certainly one year on macro conditions have, have improved and, and we're now in the, in, in the recovery phase, albeit with plenty of, of variability by regions and, and sectors, as, as you all have pointed out. So as we enter sort of the next phase, what near-term risks should investors, um, near-term or actually medium-term risks should investors be concerned about uh, in your respective regions? So Mike, let, let's start with you. Uh, what should investors be concerned about uh, in North America? Yeah, sure. Uh, government stimulus that supported the economy through the pandemic continues to wind down. So within uh, ABS, we've seen reduced reliance on support programs. So that bodes well for credit card and auto transactions, which performed better than expected through the pandemic. However, transactions exposed to subprime consumers are likely to remain vulnerable. Uh, most of the government's programs supporting RMBS are expiring now through the end of the year, uh, but it remains to be seen if the Biden administration and a Democrat-controlled Congress will change the course of U.S. housing policy, specifically with respect to the GSEs for housing finance and, and the Consumer uh, Finance Protection Bureau for consumer protection. Within CMBS, uh, office asset performance that we talked about earlier has held up um, through the pandemic due to long dated leases. However, as we see more releasing activity in the back half of this year and into 22, we'll have a better idea as to the post pandemic remote working impact on office demand, which will clearly be lower. And then lastly, related to the macro environment, a recent investor survey that we conducted indicated you know, inflation fears that result in, in an asset valuation shock and increases refinancing risk is the most prevalent risk that bears watching. And frankly, I would agree with that assessment. Thanks, Mike. So Ben, over to you. So near or medium term risks uh, investors should be concerned about in, in APAC. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, the, the outlook um, in general, the, the macro outlook across the region is pretty good. So the, the, the biggest risk on the horizon for us is, is asset prices. Um, I think I stated earlier, we've, we've started to see the LTVs climb in, in RMBS and loan sizes climb to fund the growth in asset prices. And, and we're keeping an eye on this. Uh, well, at this point, we're comfortable um, with, with what we see. Um, we, if we do need to make an adjustment to our criteria, um, if this trend continues into the future, um, we'll need to be looking at that. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. And Susanna, same question. I'll give you the last word. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will add two points. Uh, the first point is, uh, unfortunately, we cannot um, go without mentioning a potential uh, pandemic setback. Uh, so if, if a new variant occurs or the vaccines are less efficient than hoped, then this could um, obviously lead to, to a renewed economic setback. The second point um, I would want to make is that we are still in a seller's market. There's still so much liquidity around, um, even now after having gone relatively well through the pandemic, um, there is higher risk acceptance in the market, both from originators and from structurers. And um, this means that um, I think investors should be very selective, particularly with uh, regards to new lenders, non-standard, assets and structures and non-prime borrowers. Great, thank you, Susanna. So with that, I wanna thank my colleagues for sharing their insights today. So thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Susanna, and, and thank you, Ben, again. And, and to our viewers, if you have any questions on any of the topics that we discussed, please send us an email to the address on the screen or visit our website. And with that, thank you for joining us. <laughs>